Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's conversation with Raphael Perez Evans, which accompanies Raphael's exhibition Handful, uh, which is on display at the Henry Moore Institute until the end of August. I'm Lawrence Sillers, the head of the Henry Moore Institute. Uh, from where I am speaking now, I'm in our uh, sculpture research library, which like our galleries is finally reopened. And you're very welcome to, to visit at any point. Um, before we start our conversation, uh, just some general Zoom housekeeping. The event's being recorded um, and it will be available on Henry Moore Institute's YouTube channel next Wednesday, uh, as well as on our website. Uh, if you would like to use subtitles or indeed turn them off, you can click the live transcript button that's at uh, the bottom toolbar, the one with the CC symbol on it. Uh, and if at any point your video or the sound freezes you, or you're having connection issues, the old adage, adage of switching it on and off again uh, generally pays dividends. Uh, we recommend just restarting Zoom and you can rejoin the conversation using the same link. Um, Raphael and I are going to talk for maybe 30, 40 minutes and then we'd love to have any questions or comments that you might have and you can put those in the chat function. Um, again, which you can find uh, in the bottom of the bottom of the toolbar. Um, messages and questions come through anonymously, but if you'd like to let us know who you are or have your name mentioned, then, uh, then just include that in your message. Um, so to start, it's uh, an enormous pleasure to introduce Raphael Perez Evans. Uh, fantastic to see you, Raphael. Uh, Raphael lives and works in London. He's the recipient of the Henry Moore Institute and Leeds Beckett University Scholarship uh, that was organized in partnership with New Contemporaries 2019. Perez Evans received a BA and an MFA from Goldsmiths, University of London uh, in 2010 and 2020, respectively. His recent exhibitions include um, that at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Taipei, uh, one at C3A Museum in um, Cordoba, and uh, also a presentation in uh, Barcelona at the gallery Nogueras Blanchard. Um, I also really wanted to thank the sponsors of this exhibition, the Spain Arts and Culture, the Embassy of Spain in London, and the Instituto Cervantes, also in London, whose um, invaluable support really allowed us to expand the ambition and the scope of this project. So enormous thanks to them. Um, but Raphael, hi, good to see you. Hello, Lawrence. Good afternoon. So happy to be here. Such a pleasure to, um, yeah, just to expand on the many conversations we've been having. Um, great privilege. I'm conscious that um, while the amazing thing that is Zoom brings us closer together in many respects, and we're probably joined by a lot of people um, who haven't yet been able to see see the exhibition. Um, so just to kind of give that quick contextualization, um, I might just throw up some slides um, of the three works that make up Handful, uh, three works that were all made for the exhibition and um, are very much interconnected. And we'll, we'll hear about more about that journey from one uh, to the other as we progress. Um, but first off, before anyone enters the building, um, a highly visible statement that, um, that landed one Monday morning about six weeks ago, uh, the work called Mountain, uh, comprised of two enormous wheat silos that are, are planted into the black granite of our somewhat imposing building and form an incredible contrast against that shiny black granite surface. Um, you then enter the Institute and uh, walk around to um, a gallery that has a long sight line and you encounter Lake. Um, and for Lake, you've, you've flooded one of our galleries with milk, uh, literally. There is no um, trickery at play. We poured it, it's there. And uh, uh, milk churns just rest on top of that, um, that solution. 
And then, I mean, that's a space, obviously, you can't enter. There's a threshold, so you can go right up to it. But as you're standing there, you turn to your right, and on the wall is a very simple, elegant, minimal shelf, a wooden, white wooden shelf uh, with a perspex lid and a handful of wheat resting there. Um, so I wanted to start, I guess, really with the starting point of the exhibition. And there were many concerns that you had when we started thinking about what new work you would make for this occasion. Um, but the distance between the producer and the consumers of food was, was always there as an underpinning. Um, and you fairly swiftly mentioned to me, and I was surprised at, the, at this reference, um, the, the BBC spaghetti tree hoax of, of 1957. Um, and this is something I'd known about for a long time, and uh, you clearly had too. And then I started mentioning it to colleagues and, and um, other folks, and actually not many people had heard of it. So 57, I guess it was a generational thing. Um, so let's just remind ourselves of what that hoax was. We've got an image and a, a, a little clip um, from the BBC from that year, 1957. So maybe if we just play that. It isn't only in Britain that spring this year has taken everyone by surprise. Here in the Ticino, on the borders of Switzerland and Italy, the slopes overlooking Lake Lugano have already burst into flower, at least a fortnight earlier than usual. But what, you may ask, has the early and welcome arrival of bees and blossom to do with food? Well, it's simply that the past winter, one of the mildest in living memory, has had its effect in other ways as well. Most important of all, it's resulted in an exceptionally heavy spaghetti crop. The last two weeks of March, are an anxious time for the spaghetti farmer. There's always the chance of a late frost, which, while not entirely ruining the crop, generally impairs the flavor and makes it difficult for him to obtain top prices in world markets. But now these dangers are over and the spaghetti harvest goes forward. Spaghetti cultivation here in Switzerland is not, of course, carried out on anything like the tremendous scale of the Italian industry. Many of you, I'm sure, will have seen pictures of the vast spaghetti plantations in the Po Valley. For the Swiss, however, it tends to be more of a family affair. Another reason why this may be a bumper year lies in the virtual disappearance of the spaghetti weevil, the tiny creature whose depredations have caused much concern in the past. After picking, the spaghetti is laid out to dry in the warm alpine sun. Many people are often puzzled by the fact that spaghetti is produced at such uniform length. But this is the result of many years of patient endeavor by plant breeders who've succeeded in producing the perfect spaghetti. And now the harvest is marked by a traditional meal. Toasts to the new crop are drunk in these boccalinos. And then the waiters enter bearing the ceremonial dish. And it is, of course, spaghetti. Picked earlier in the day, dried in the sun, and so brought fresh from garden to table at the very peak of condition. For those who love this dish, there's nothing like real homegrown spaghetti. So, so tell us, Raphael, what, what drew you to that? What are the starting points? Thank you so much for like, start having a soft entry into quite a kind of dangerous separation. I think it's a good softness to, to start conversing about something quite complex and, and difficult and in my understanding quite dangerous, which is hyper separation from the city, the city being hyper separated to the countryside and the rural world and, and, and um, um, that distance uh, being um, grow, like that distance growing day by day. And I guess that um, the question of spaghetti growing on trees is, is not that far from a lot of, you know, young kids in any neighborhood in London never seen, you know, uh, a, a, not a potato growing, for example, you know, things like that. And um, the, the film from 57, I guess, is, is, is an interesting time to start thinking about how uh, that separation was growing, because a lot of people started believing that in the UK. It was presented in the BBC. And, 
and that holds um even though it sounds really playful for me it's quite delicate actually you know it's a delicate thing for people to think that spaghetti grows in trees and so there's there's a great um writer who, who talks about the kind of the incremental sort of distance between people and and foods and people and the countryside and people and ecology and all of these things and and says that the, the metabolism of the world is is kind of uh, there's a feature in the metabolism of the world um, and that's um, due to that uh, distance and disconnection and separation and it's it's um, yeah for me it's, it was quite kind of funny when I find funny things around agriculture and food and I laugh at it um, it's for me an interesting laugh you know because it's quite tragic in a lot of ways that laughter so, so it's very often I, I find these little uh, moments of laughter that then kind of bridge quite quickly into tragedy. So it was a kind of interesting entry point to, to this question of, of how people in cities have been made uh, separate and distant to food production, plants um, and uh, the rural world. Yeah. I think, I mean, we were talking just a few moments ago before this conversation went live about some of the the broader reactions to mountain outside of the institute and even talking um to people today there, there's confusion about what those structures are those silos are and um many people thinking that they were storage tanks for for milk mm. unrefrigerated things that are just sitting there full of full of liquid and that um that distance is, is still palpable and i think critical to a lot of your thinking i mean you mentioned this term hyper separation which um i think we should pause on for a second and it'd be very good to know exactly what that is for you what the implications are what the what the underpinnings are well the, the, the kind of there's many implications to this hyper separation i mean According to Jason W. Moore, uh, this hyper-separation started in, in the late uh, 14th century, I believe, early capitalism, bringing in um, this, this idea that you could um, commercialize anything. You know, so we think about uh, colonial plantations, which was a system of separating certain um, plants and just extracting as much commerce out of those plants and the, the laborers of those plants. And um, so with that kind of mindset, um, I feel that a lot of the metropolis were built from that mindset, you know, kind of take, build, and metropolis are architectural spaces, concrete, generally speaking, and that grew enormously. So it's this kind of hungry kind of monster that takes and doesn't give back. And the interesting thing around taking and not giving back is the ethics of that for me and kind of thinking about how do you create a non-ethical humanity or a non-ethical city that that gets separated from you know what happens when you extract too much from a site or from a body or from a community yeah so i think for me it's, it's kind of very curious to to think about the the kind of the how the metropolis and how the urban world needs that hyper separation that spaghetti grows on trees that kind of blindness to that culture in order to continue extracting. So, you know, we're in a moment of, of climate collapse. Why did that happen? You know, we, we all have had a lot of information along the way that the system wasn't working, but we are separated from the actual, um, you know, well, until recently, we've been quite separated from that collapse touching our bodies, yeah? Like that, that crisis. So that's hyper-separation, is that alienation for me from the structures and communities and sites and lands that feed us you know we just take it you know we give it for get it for granted that that's um, a given and of course it's no longer really possible as we're seeing with the climate collapse so it's it, it, there's a lot of things involved in that web of, of hyper separation but at an initial point i would say that that it's it's policies is um is creating blindness in, in a lot of people that will not complain about certain things that, as we know now, are making us, making the tender world collapse. Yeah. Food blindness, in fact, which is a term you've used previously. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess one thing that, that really 
isn't subject to that separation is the relationship between um, between food and capitalism. Food is as much a commodity as any other at the moment, and that that's um, certainly a, a topic of investigation in in um, Jason Moore and Raj Patel's book that you just alluded to. Um, but a motivation also for the, some of these structures and the language in this exhibition, the titles, mm -hmm. is the, the rise of surpluses. Can you say a bit more about that? Absolutely, yeah, like surplus, uh, let's say a culture of surplus has been an interesting uh, thing for me to kind of look at. Um, we had a lot of discussions, you and I, about kind of the idea of landscape and the idea of scale, you know, very large scale. So um, we, we, I remember we, we started looking at, at this, um, images of grey mountains and butter mountains and and that's uh, uh, something that came about um, in the EU and I mean I, it exists in other countries as well under the umbrella of food protectionism and food security and um, it's very interesting to to think about um, what happens when when you stock but you don't stop one ton two tons but you start stocking kind of I don't know 50 tons, 100 tons, and, and the growth of that um, stocking becomes very much something out of our hands, yeah, out of our immediate kind of bodily scale, and, and it gets out of hand quite quickly. So um, governmental interventionism um, at a European level has been something um, for me that has been quite pivotal in, in my understanding of, of of scale and in understanding the kind of the many sort of problems around um, central government interventionism in relationship to food um, at a governmental level, but then at a local level. So it's it's quite a, a sort of um, a charged zone, I would say, for many. I mean, it continues to be so in in the new landscape of of um, Brexit and um, current um, European policies. Um, yeah. I think, I think like, um, I mean, as you mentioned, the distance between the producers and the consumers of food, so much of this is, is about um, visibility. And it always struck me as interesting, the language that we use to describe this situation, which you've brought front and centre into this exhibition. You have mountain, you have lake, you have handful, especially mountain and lake. They're these sort of serene pastoral other places. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this sort of blanket of coding that obscures all of this from the start. Um, I mean, I guess with those market forces, it's not only the impact on on food, but um, also the the impact on people, the communities, the farming communities, and the cheapening of um, of labour. Absolutely, and I think, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's. It's very interesting how that cheapening, I mean, I was very much obsessed with that cheapening from quite an early age in my own life, how that affects people directly. And there's a link that I would like to kind of comment on, which is the link between uh, food laborers, at least the ones that I know in Southern Europe, um, the ones that I work with, and uh, land and landscape. And, um, there's, there's an interesting link around how, even though land is extracted from in certain types of agricultural um, ways of working, um, in small holding agricultural ways of working, the land at times is protecting from, let's say, building um, or kind of expansion of the city. And um, what I found quite interesting is, is kind of thinking about um, small holding agricultural workers is kind of almost guardians or protectors of that landscape and that land and what's been happening um, in relationship to this kind of butter mountains and milk milk lakes and grain mountains is that by um, by bringing forward all of these um, grand um, policies at a European level there's been a lot of kind of um, repercussions at a small scale, local scale, in many agricultural communities um, 
around, particularly, I mean, in the whole of Europe and globally, you know, we've seen recently a lot of um, major uh, farming um, sort of talk in India as well. So what I'm trying to say here is that it's, it's the link happens, you know, when, when these policies get written, and I think here about uh, Jan Bo, you know, when, when he brings in this kind of chandeliers that were kind of part of the decor of a great, you know, the Paris Agreement in 19, I can't remember the, the exact date, but just to think about the signing of these agreements, the kind of the reverberations, you know, the waves of, um, of, of, of that signing, how they reverberate and kind of, you know, change the landscape to so many people and communities that are attached to those policies and that are attached to those ways of living. And for me, agriculture, smallholding and peasantry um, are ways of living together. And this is kind of an interesting word here, like kind of living together, coming back to the kind of hyper separation, living together as community, as interlinked with plants and foods. And that starts breaking apart when these sort of policies come in and then we start living separated. Yeah. So this idea of separation and togetherness is quite cool for my Sort of, sort of larger themes that are happening in the work. Um, yeah. And I mean, one of those large themes that comes from the result of that separation is this this element and spirit and tradition of protest, which you have um, your own connections to. You you grew up as part of a, a farming family within a farming community. Um, and certainly those lang that language, the aesthetics of protest, the, the gestures of protest have informed, um, well, especially Lake downstairs, but other works of yours historically uh, grounding, of course, your, your piece at Goldsmiths, um, which we can move on to. But maybe tell us about your experiences of, of protest in Spain when you were growing up. What did you witness? Well, I think, I mean, I think for me, this, if we just move back to that slide with the lemons, it's, this is kind of like a core site of how, of a lot of the work that, um, that I have been making in recent years departs from this place, which is, this is the, the agricultural cooperative uh, in my hometown, which is now being moved outside of the, of the center of town because it's, I mean, I, I guess the, the, the space is, is best for them to, I mean, anyway, it's a new piece I'm making around the, the kind of the architecture of this site. But um, what happened here is, I believe now, I'm, I recently went to the archive and I spoke to the, the people still working at the cooperative and they told me that this lasted around a decade, um, this issue of um, lemon devaluation. So what you're seeing here is the kind of sort of masses and masses of lemons. Um, my dad worked in this cooperative, so, I was born in 83 and I spent probably, I don't know, like a couple of days a week <laughs> after school going to this site. And on this site, uh, there was, I guess, a lot of anger, you know, a lot of frustration and anger around policies that were devaluing the work and I guess history of a lot of these people, which are people in my family as well. And, and I, understood quite quickly that there was something going on around this, this kind of monochromatic um, mass of, of lemons and what was happening at a kind of family level. But a lot of people cut down the trees of lemons. They were devalued to such a place that it was no longer possible to, to make a living out of, out of um, producing lemons and, and selling them. And, and the protests, uh, made, I mean, at quite a young age, I, I saw this kind of sea of lemons and I was sort of kind of, I became quite obsessed with that, that image. And, and since then I've been collecting many, many, many uh, press clippings and, and um, videos around this kind of gesture when, when someone is silenced and put into a place of severe anguish and, and disorientation, you know, when things don't longer make sense, what comes out of that is at times this kind of quite guttural gesture of anger mm -hmm. and protests hold that kind of, that, that synergy, you know, that energy, that temperament of responding to an injustice. And, 
And in that response, they create a voice. And in this voice, there's something quite incredible happening because it's a protest through a produce, you know? It's the language goes into the material mm -hmm. and the material becomes a voice. And that kind of transition between one and the other, for me, is a pretty fascinating um, gesture, which of course, in art, we're quite used to thinking about sculptural gestures, but when I look at farming culture and I find similar gestures, you know, we could look at land art and build quite a fast bridge between those gestures in the 60s and onwards and to this sort of thing. And, and for me, it's kind of thinking, you know, the art is happening at so many levels in so many different sites. And, and, and it's quite in, kind of incredible to think about the kind of language, visual and, and aesthetic and, and kind of political languages that articulate it from a place of helplessness, you know? Because there's something that about when you take into the edge of yourself and your life and, and, and you're at a breaking point, something comes beyond the rational, I think. And that for me is a really interesting position to think about gesture and sculpture and, and I guess, language, yeah. Um, let's maybe follow on from here with your work grounding that you realized <clears throat> at Goldsmiths last year. Talk us through this. Okay, so this is um, grounding was a piece I did for my MA. I, I returned to study after 10 years. Um, I lived in the Global South for a few years. I was very fortunate to be able to produce work then. And in that time, I, I started kind of sort of understanding that, that those ideas around hyper separation and sort of my separation to my own body and to my own kind of history and culture and, and my sort of, sort of interest in experimenting as to how could that be brought back. So grounding is, is a kind of it's quite a, I mean, just departing from the word monumental, it's quite a large scale artwork in which I borrowed um, the gesture of dumping, which is um, a gesture, not a gesture, it's a, it's a a practice of protest, which happens, in my understanding, mostly in Europe, um, around a response to devaluation of produce um, and a devaluation of the labor, a cheapening of the of the produce and a cheapening of the laborers. And they, when they get angry, they go from the outskirts of the city or the towns or the countryside and come to the city and do a dump, which is throwing large large amounts of produce into urban sites, a lot of the time into governmental buildings. So I, I, I was doing so much kind of uh, ecology research at my time of doing my MFA at Goldsmiths. And I just felt there was this kind of, again, this hyper separation, you know, this kind of voicing from the city around structures and things that they weren't touched. And I liked the idea of getting things dirty. So I felt that I wanted to make Goldsmith's building, like touch the soil again and touch the kind of things that they're being preoccupied with in a non-symbolic way. And um, I guess that um, maybe if you want to play it, it, it um, might be quite quick. That was again a bit of a laughter ending to to the to the thing, but um, yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it was a complex piece that of course, yeah. it was a complex piece. I mean, I already worked with large large amounts of foodstuffs in in exhibitions in certain institutions in Spain, and I guess that there was something that I hadn't taken into account, which is the fact that in the UK, the kind of protests um, from farmers are not as, um, how would I say, kind of monumental as the ones that I kind of am used to and experience. So I guess there was a bit of a, a cultural clash around that. Um, you know, in other countries, 
I, I, like, I like to use the word pigs, like Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, there's more of, of a kind of understanding of this sort of um, gesture, um, or it's more in, within the landscape of the news. So um, I guess that was also one of the kind of raptures in the work. Yeah. And I think, I mean, staying on this concern of protest for, um, for a little bit longer, there was a very strong reaction to this work and there were protests against your protest. What, um, what was that journey for you? Did, did you anticipate those reactions? Were they part of your expectations? I, I guess, I mean, it was also like a quite a, a, a peculiar moment in time. It was COVID, October 1920. We, were, we weren't going to have a show and it was, everything was about a breaking point. And I mean, even though I've done this kind of works before, I, I wasn't really, I mean, I was thinking a lot about the work and the kind of repercussions. I thought there would be more repercussions around press, but not at a kind of immediate level. There were quite a few students that, that, that had a, a strong reaction with the work or against the work and created a kind of a protest around it for a number of days. And I mean, I'm happy, you know, I mean, I'm happy that, that things is a cause and effect because I'm happy around impoliteness. I'm happy around things that are beyond the kind of convivial institutional way that we kind of have been made to engage with things. You know, it's kind of like, it's, it's behaviors that are off, are a bit difficult, are complex. And I think maybe I also want a bit of that in the kind of art world I inhabit, because if not, it just becomes a little bit of this, you know, kind of robotic parrot, paraphrasing, talking symbol, you know, it's kind of, you know, a bit of a clash. I think it's necessary and a bit of a clash that, you know, you feel touch, you feel something is happening. And I guess that for me is important because I, you know, there's a certain liveliness to that, you know, being alive, coming back to that life beyond that kind of polite, disconnected culture that I feel that I, I, I live in, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult. But I guess that all of those things for me are prolonging the conversation and, and it's a cause and effect, you know, like it's, it's ongoing, you know, the reverberations are ongoing. So I was... You know, it wasn't easy. I'm not going to say it was easy because there was a lot of backlash online as well. And, but at the same time, looking retrospectively, it's, it's, it's good. Things reverberate and things, things are touching. And, and there's so much of a shield that we all have mm -hmm. to not be touched, to not feel that. I guess that in this case, it's, it's, it was a good, um, I don't know, like a little tiny rapture in that. And I, I, I'm quite happy about that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think a lot of your work makes me think about notions of belonging or perhaps not belonging. I mean, on a very uh, immediate level, of course, you're using materials that often don't belong in the situations that you encounter them. The, the many, many tons of carrots blocking the path into Goldsmiths being one of them, the, the silos that are outside, the very urban context of the Institute being another. Um, but I wonder also how much this is about um, the body and it's belonging to either one of those two frameworks that you've outlined, the rural context or, or the metropolis and that, that rub. I mean, yeah, I wish it was more of a rub. For me, it's quite, <laughs> it's quite like a difficult, it's, it's for me, those two things, it's biographically my own history, they're clashing constantly. And, and there's something around that kind of paradox, push and pull between those two kind of sites, communities and ways of existing in the world that I'm trying to negotiate, you know, I'm trying to experiment with, with those two positions. I ran away from Spain. I hated all of this. I hated it. I, 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 I couldn't hate it more when I was a growing up a child, queer child in Southern Spain, quite a conservative environment. Um, I hated this. I hated labor. I hate going, my dad, he had a lorry, not a, like a van and we would go and take vegetables and fruits. I would help him the weekend to this, you know, package holiday tourist in the next town to us. I hated lifting things. I hated the kind of physicality and the kind of expectation of, of labor. 
I really, really rejected all of that. I thought then I'm different. I need, I need to go to the city. I need to move outside of this as soon as possible with this kind of hope of freedom. You know what I mean? Like I came to London with this idea like, oh, I'm going to kind of, I don't know, sort of clean up all of this. You know, it's almost like a, an exercise of become sophisticated, you know, like clean up all that kind of rawness that I thought was unacceptable. And, and it's for me, it's kind of, it's a push. It's a constant battle. It's a complete paradox of, of those two kind of planets that are for me constantly colliding and I'm trying to find a dialogue between them, you know, somehow. And sometimes the crash is bigger than the dialogue and I lose the communication, but I guess the works that are also reverberating in that way, uh, in that kind of complexity and, and positions of paradox and, 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 and the difficulty in, 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 for me, like, I don't know, I guess, I got trapped with this kind of idea of the city. I got trapped with becoming cosmopolitan and sophisticated. It's a mess. It's a complete fuck up, like for me. Like, and I had to leave the UK in 2010 to, I moved to Mexico, I was working there. And to, to start kind of with, again, distance, you know, in, get, in this case, the positive distance to kind of really re-articulate myself and my desires and my sense of, so-called freedom that collapsed, you know, queer London didn't quite work out in the way that I thought would be free, you know, freeing enough. And, and that's why I've been kind of moving forward towards these other ways of living and existing in the world, which is for me, have a sense of connectivity and living together, you know. So in some of these communities that I run away from now I'm realizing, oh, there was a lot of join, joining moments and points in these communities, in these ways of existing with each other, with the soil, with food, less alienation. So I'm kind of, I'm all constantly back and forth between these two states and kind of positions. And it's, it's tough, it's difficult, you know, for me. I'm just maybe... You mentioned the metabolism of the city earlier, which is, you know, a very interesting concept, this thing that pulls you in, but metabolism means it, it gets you, it chews you up, it saps your energy, and then it, it spits you out. Um, I was going to um, leave the questions until the end, and I think we'll focus on the bulk of them. Um, but an interesting question has just come through about uh, your relationship with art education, shall we say, and uh, <laughs> um, both entering it and exiting it and re-entering it. And you spoke um, previously about a frustration with um, Western learning models and you were then just talking about this escape um to the global south and a and a more together way of living um so the question is um well really about your relationship to to education and um that path to becoming an artist through those systems so maybe we can think about that and tell us more about the alternative um the way of living that you you found when you traveled? I mean, the whole thing is a trap, meaning, you know, it's a trap written by the Anglo-Saxon world, you know, meaning to be an artist, you need to come to a London school, you know, in a lot of cases, or an, an American school. And I fell into that trap, you know, even though I received a lot from those sites, I, 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 I didn't finish my BA. I left it twice. I couldn't cope with it. I felt completely disassociated. I already had disassociated tendencies. So being at Goldsmiths, just using my head so much and kind of, it's almost like this kind of float, I became this floating head that was chewing in all this information. And it's, it was really tough for me. I mean, the MA as well. And I'm, I, I just became like this kind of flying head, disembodied, you know, and, and I had to, yeah, it was really tough for me. Um, and, and, I was fortunate that I got a job in Mexico and I, I moved there and um, I started encountering other ways of, of doing things at a more bodily level. And I think that's when I was making video and photography before I left um, the UK. And it was for me kind of a return to my kind of almost expanding. It's like, oh, okay, let's start drawing a larger picture of what I am. There's, I'm not a floating head, there's a neck. Oh, okay, let's draw an arm. Oh, an arm came out, oh, there's a hand or you can pick things with your hand, you know, you can. <laughs> and so it's almost kind of like reimagining what 
my my bodiliness is and what I can do with that. And I guess that that chopping of the head is very much very present in, in, in British institutions. You know, this kind of floating heads running around. I mean, not even running, they're just floating, chewing, talking, like, and it's, it's for me, it's quite delicate to, to, to think that it, it's such a disembodied experience, you know, and I, I think in many places in, in Brazil that I was very fortunate to be a part of, um, we started kind of experimenting with, with more, a more kind of, I don't know, a more embodied experience of, of thinking, researching, eating, sleeping, fucking, I mean, all these things, you know what I mean? It's like this division is a mess and it's, it has to do with hyper-separation and this kind of constant sophistication. So in Brazil, you know, we were kind of living and researching and, and the food became like, it's kind of like, as you digest information, you can also digest food and not separating this. And I, you know, in Goldsmiths, I was always wondering like, why are we in this lecture theater? Separate, it's like a cutoff, and the gallery sometimes that's left too. It's kind of this amputation of things, holding them outside of, you know. So it's, it's a delicate thing, but I guess I, there are many people that try to do things less in a less disembodied way. And for me, it's always, you know, the title grounded, it's coming back to the ground and coming back to the body and all these sort of, a lot of these exercises. Um, and full as well, of course, being the thing that fits in your hand, but also that which represents the basic, the fundamental need and quantity of need to, to sustain us, to fulfill us. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe we could look at the piece handful, because I think it's, it's quite interesting to go from that monumental hmm. you know, 29 tons of, of, of produce to something which I guess came out from that place during the pandemic when we were chatting, you know, weekly, I believe. And, and it, it has a certain tenderness, you know, this kind of immediacy of, okay, my stomach has a certain size, my mouth has a certain size and my hand can hold so much. So handful becomes this kind of antidote in some way for me, this kind of symbolic and what's well, symbolic and not symbolic, you know, it's kind of, this scale which is graspable is within my hands, within your hands, you know, we can hold this. It's not out of hands, you know, like the mountains, like the lakes, it's within our grasp. And I think there's something around um, this, this kind of return to, to the immediate and to what's really kind of necessary that, that came from a place of quite, I would say, severe tenderness that I felt during the pandemic. And, in conversation with you and and to kind of start seeing that as almost like a kind of a future facing possibility you know this kind of return to the, the, the kind of the most immediate thing and 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 that really stood against this kind of blade runner future that we've been sold you know this kind of hyper connected world you know where things are flying around but then everyone is in my opinion we all become kind of disembodied and alienated and so it's yeah I, I guess that this is circulating around that as well this 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 measure you know of the hand and and then just <laughs> maybe we could um just talk about being a nuisance a little bit and disrupting and because being a handful is also that you know which of course <laughs> go for it i never found you one but um <laughs> I wish I was more, but um, you know, the the, the I guess that the work lake, you know, it's 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 again borrowing from the protesters, and um, and and being a nuisance, being something that it's a bit of a handful, it's a bit difficult, and going back to the earlier conversations, being a bit impolite and and not kind of um, fulfilling some of the kind of let's say so-called bourgeois expectations of how we meant to move, exist, and, and speak in the world and, and finding other ways of articulating frustration or anguish or anger or not having a voice. So, so I guess that Lake did really come from that place of, of, of looking into those, um, those gestures and, 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 and in some way kind of meditating on them. Maybe if we can find the image of, of the room, um, it would be kind of interesting. Firmness and shepherds on the.
the that's a, a good kind of example of of um of the process but again i wanted to play on the kind of on the kind of meditative sense of of this aftermath of a protest that for me was was sort of a kind of moving forward from grounding in which the room became quite silent um, and 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 stained with this kind of uh, milk and and again it's kind of what happens after that uh, gesture and, and it becomes a site for that a little bit which is quieter than some of the other pieces so it's kind of it's a moment after the rage and um, it's a different dialogue but it's um, yeah very much so it there is a, an astonishing feeling of serenity there it it's a very calm contemplative it's the calm after the storm isn't it mm. um i feel the questions are, are are racking up and i want to make sure that we get through as many as possible Absolutely. Um, i'm curious to know before we get there about your your journey as a maker and your relationship with your materials i mean throughout the works that we've been talking about this evening your raw material is the subject the material and the subject are one and the same you're not using a material to represent something else um that directness has uh, an art historical legacy but i was curious if it was ever thus for you you mentioned um initially using the lens, a camera, a video, there are other ways you could represent this thing. So why, why that very direct relationship with the material? And was there a journey of discovery before that, that clicked? Absolutely. Like I was saying before, like doing my BA, I guess there was a kind of, the lens gives you a certain, it's, the politics of the lens give you a certain uh, shielding, you know, from whatever it is that you are working with. And, and there was something about me leaving the UK and kind of through a disenchantment um, to kind of to start articulating myself into the language of objects and materials. And I, I, for me, it, it, it took so many years to trust that I can work with the, the things that I also have an instinctual kind of immediate relationship to. And that comes from things like dirt, you know, like potatoes. So I worked with jams in the past or very, very kind of basic immediate things that at an instinctual level, I have a pull towards. And that pull has also to do with, with very basic kind of surface structural things that happen in those objects. You know, it's, it's almost like the, the cleanliness of the city draw me quite quickly into its markets, you know, like, and I started kind of again, sort of re-engaging with sites that have certain patinas of, of dirt and that dirt, gave me a certain comfort, you know, at a bodily level. And, and kind of re, the more I, re, I engage with that and the more I trusted that that kind of instinct is, is valuable, you know, beyond the rational sometimes, just that kind of natural pull towards an object. Um, to trust that was, was quite, I guess, I guess it took a while, you know, it, it took a while to, to understand that that is sufficient. Rebecca Warren sometimes talk about, talks about instinct in a really beautiful way. And, and it's quite sort of inspiring to think that that can be a sufficient, that pull can be an initial kind of drive towards making work with certain things. And again, like you have people like David Hammonds who talks about dumbing things down, you know, trusting the basics. And I guess that it took for me a certain, um, I don't know, it took quite a lot of work to, to arrive at a point in which I'm like, okay, this can be it, you know, it's all here, it's all, present in the object itself and I don't need to do too much to it you know if anything I transplant it I, I, I like the idea of transplant I get one thing and transplant it in a new place but it contains that kind of rawness and, and immediacy I guess it's something very immediate to these materials which uh, is important for me. It's interesting you <clears throat> touched on that particular element of David Hammond's work um, Hammonds is also someone who has spoken a lot about where the experience of art should happen. You know, very much that you encounter art or the ideal encounter with art is between your front door and the gallery. Mm. So the idea of going to the gallery to see the exhibition is, is an anathema. 
uh, art is the thing that you encounter on the street by chance, which is why he did that. And the, um, you know, your source materials are those incidental moments in life, the kind of, um, yeah, the unexpected bits that you embrace and somehow bring into the gallery. So there's a kind of tension there with um, what the gallery actually does, which I will move from uh, to one of the questions that I did just see pop up. I wonder if I can find it again. Um, really about the relationship between... Um, so when we think about separation in capitalism, um, are you using the gallery as a place of isolation or a means of exaggerating moments of isolation? And could you say more about the role of the gallery in your work? Well, I mean, the role of the gallery, it's becoming like a kind of a site of contestation, meaning, you know, in this case, I mean, in an ideal world, I would like to continue kind of bumping more into the gallery, especially the facade. I think the facade is a really interesting kind of, it's a, it's a place of porosity. You know, there's a bit more porousness in between public and the kind of the, the possible coldness of institutional uh, politics, you know? And I think that the facade of, sorry? You mean literally the facade of art? Literally, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, yeah. I think there's something to think about around the facade of institutional spaces as sites of perhaps greater porosity than the, the within the, the, the gallery. And what I mean by this is, as you were saying, the passerby, you know, is it kind of the, the passerby for me is it becoming quite an integral, um, what would I say, a, a, a integral person in, 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 in the work, you know, who is accessing the work as they go by the day. And, Ideally, um, we talked about the unexpected, and for me, the unexpected um, or the bumping into something which creates a certain moment of disorientation, of a certain moment of, of conundrum, of a certain moment of not fully understanding something, that's a good moment, you know? The moment that you fall a little bit outside of the usual and something throws you a little bit of balance. And in that losing your balance, I feel there's a greater possibility to kind of absorb things from a different place. And I guess, I mean, Hammonds was, is a master of that, you know, and I guess I still need to do a lot of work to, to, to build closer to that, that kind of moment of, of, of where the body mind loses its balance. And I think losing the balance is, is a very important thing, which within the institution, there's more protection, I think. As a viewer, there's less possibility because the politics are at place, you know? We all understand the politics of behavior, of how we can relate to things and ideas within, you know, the enclosure of an institution. Outside, there's a little bit more, there's a tiny bit more space, I think, to, to, to create a tiny bit more features, you know, a little bit more of an opening towards this, this possible porosity, bringing down, disarm, being disarmed, you know, like bringing your weapons down. It's, it's all for me about this kind of breaking away from this shield which ha we have constructed against each other. You know, we are all protecting each other. Sorry, we are all pro protecting ourselves from each other. Alienation, you know, this separation is, is constant. So how can we create moments of proximity with ourselves, with the world? It's, it's an ongoing thing, I guess, yeah. Um, <laughs> there's another question here in Brittany, and actually I've he heard of this as uh, an example of farming protests in, in this country, one of the few ones, but in this example in Brittany, they use manure quite often as a form of protest. Uh, would excrement be a next step for you? <laughs> I mean, I thought about, I, I had a, a proposition which I never sent to you, which was manure is used with, with a lot of straw. And it was a really messy kind of facade that I envisaged for the Henry Moore. And I didn't send it because there's something, I guess, more enigmatic about the piece that we, we put in place here. But um, I mean, I, I'm open to all materials, you know, I'm open to, to, to all materials, but there's something about the enigma, which for me is also important. You know, with the carrots, it became quite enigmatic and unusual. Manure is, it's, I mean, it's, it's a possibility, why not? Yeah. 
Um, there's also some really interesting uh, book recommendations, which I'm going to crib and uh, send to you afterwards. So thank you to everyone who's um, recommending um, some reading material. Um, we're almost out of time. So if there are any other questions, do just pop them through. Um, here's one. Can you, uh, yeah, and actually I wanted to talk to you about um, time and the significance in, in your work. So this is a, a very pertinent question. Can you talk about the significance of decay, live objects rotting, uh, the milk, the carrots? Yeah, I mean, that, I guess, there was a point in time when I was make, you know, before I was saying I was making this video work and there's, there's a, there's a, it's forever, you know, well, I mean, forever, as long as it's archived. And when I started working with things at a very domestic level, I would bring, let's say, potatoes home or various vegetables and I would just throw them in the studio as well. And I would have them just lying there as piles and they would just go down and there's something about the affectation and the emotion around being affected by food rotting that I was quite intrigued about, you know, the, the, how people reacted to this thing rotting was for me very problematic. Meaning outside my studio in Illusion, there, there are a lot of people on the streets and I was like, okay, how is this happening? How does a rotting tomato or a rotting potato have, or a rotting carrot have more power to this to kind of, of feeling of emotion than a human being. And then I was just like, this is really quite bonkers, you know, how people react to this rotting and get affected by it. It's, it's, it was quite an unusual kind of discovery, I would say. Um, and I, I held on to that. To, I was very intrigued by, by that um, emotionality, how a lot of people reacted to these things. Um, and, and I guess that I'm still kind of sort of assessing it or kind of experimenting with it. And, and it's, it's complex because museums, when I show these things in, in institutions, there's a lot of complex politics at play around duration and around um, uh, archiving and how long should they last and change and so it, it becomes quite a, a laborful um, engagement with, with the work but um, yeah it's it's complex it's difficult and most importantly and I guess I, even though this is such a like trope this idea of memento mori but it kind of for me it does feel a bit like that you know it does kind of activate this sense of of loss of patina of, of shine it's it's something which which is disappearing at a, quite a fast rate and i guess that at a, at a kind of human level we a lot of people react or engage with that quite quickly and can sort of anthropomorphize i can't say that word the, the vegetable and relate that to their own um life i guess and and i think that that idea of sense of time is is or loss of time and entropy is, is also embedded in, in working in that way, yeah. Thank you, Raphael. Um, maybe just one final question. What's, what's next? What are you working on now? Well, I'm working on a few things, but I'm working in Southern Spain um, on a couple of projects and um, I can't really say fully what they are, but um, we are, I'm very excited. One of them might be quite monumental and it would be more entangled than grounding. It would be, it would kind of go, let's say from seed to distribution of, of a certain uh, food. And um, other than that, I'm also working um, with sound, which is a newbie for me. Um, I'm making a, a piece on sound around bending over, um, around this, this thing of bodies that have to bend down. So like food laborers, Mm -hmm. um, historically queer people, mothers that bend their bodies down to feed the children or sorry to feed babies and this idea of, of this resistance to, to effort and to bending down and to continually be upright is, is I'm, I'm working around that, that difficulty of, of um, effort yeah um, that's where I'm 
I'm, I'm at at the moment. Yeah. Great. Well, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing it, and I will just say that you you have a um, you're very good at updating your website. So <laughs> anyone who is interested in seeing and hearing those next steps should um, should tune in and keep informed. Um, we're kind of out of time. I could talk to you for many other hours, many further hours, as you well know. Um, but we should probably draw this to a close. And I'll just thank everyone ever so much for, for engaging. There are some really lovely questions. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of them, but I hope we touched on things that gave you something of an answer, even if we didn't get to them directly. Um, Raphael, it's just always such an enormous pleasure talking to you. We were ever so lucky to have these really regular communications and Zoom meetings throughout lockdown, um, just, just stating this exhibition and the works that have turned into Handful, and that was um, a privilege and uh, a salvation during those dark, lonely months of um, lockdown. So thank you for those. Thank you for this exhibition. The exhibition handful, as a reminder, is on until the last day of August. So there's plenty of time to see it. Um, mountain is visible, viewable 24 hours a day. The wonders of being on the facade of an institution rather than inside. Uh, but Raphael, thank you ever so much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say massive thank you to Lawrence, especially like you've been amazing and just it's also so beautiful to be able to build with a curator hand by hand and build something together. And again, like everyone at the Institute has been absolutely superb and generous and, and, and yeah, I'm just really, really grateful for, for this opportunity and yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Raphael. And thank you all very much for joining us. We, we appreciated your company. See you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.